everyone. This is Anna Nisterova, and welcome to my podcast. Today, my guest is Angela Nguigwe, and he joined me. It's a dear friend of mine, and I'm welcoming you here. Thanks, Angela, for uh, joining me in my podcast, and thanks for connecting with me from what Calgary. Are you still in Calgary? I am in Calgary. I am in Calgary, yes. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. I start my podcast with a little story how I meet my guests, how I met them. So we met through a program that we both took at the University of Calgary. We both went to an MBT program, which is Master's of Biomedical Technology. And I remember I was volunteering at the company you were working at. That's how we met. And we remained friends since then. And I cherish the friendship and all the years we've known each other. And I am very excited to have you on board today because you will share your story with my listeners because I think you have an amazing story starting from where you are right now and obviously where you came from. And again, I think we should just jump into it. And I want to ask you to tell tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, where you, do you work right now and how you got to where you are. Sounds good. Sounds good. First of all, I want to say that I am actually super excited to be on this uh, on this channel. Uh, it's so good to see you uh, do what you're doing and just reaching people. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for um, this this honor that you, you're doing me. And as you know, I love talking too. So, <laughs> so this will be good. Uh, all right. So about, about me. So um, I'm Angelo. I was uh, born in uh, Italy. So I am, um, but I am on Nigerian descent. So my parents are from Nigeria. That's why I'm a little bit more tanned than most Italians, as you can tell. Um, I, I grew up in Italy and, uh, and then I ended up, um, moving, uh, from Italy to, um, Scotland, Aberdeen, Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, and I lived there for a few years and then, uh, I ended up moving here to Canada in, uh, uh, 2010, 2010. Uh, and at that time I was coming here to do my master's. And so, um, and so then, and here I am now I live, I live here and I've been, um, I've, I've settled down here. Um, I got, um, I am married. Um, I was lucky enough to marry the, um, the most beautiful person you'll ever meet. And, uh, and that is my wife, Jasmine. And, uh, and we live here in Calgary. So, how did I how did I get to where I'm at right now? Well, I work for an organization called MyTax, and um, we are a national not for profit organization. And uh, what we do is, in a nutshell, we support innovation in Canada. So we create different programs, uh, but all of our programs are uh, about connect around connecting uh, industry uh, and academia uh, to form uh, innovative collaborations um, to develop projects, solve some problems, um, and uh, also at the same time train uh, students um, and researchers. So we're, we're trying to do two things. One, help the country uh, by promoting innovation. Uh, and two is to uh, just train and create the next generation of innovators and scientists that are coming out of our academic institutions. Yeah. And I think that's something that brings us together in a sense of we both love the innovation component and especially we both came, came from the biomedical background. So yeah. anything that is related to that, it definitely unites us in our, I guess, mission and what we want to do in life. So I think yeah. that's quite exciting what you do with my text. Um, and I guess, well, let's start, let's start to uncover your story layer by layer because right. the first thing you said that you were originally from Italy but I want to know more about how that transition from one country to another happened for you because yeah. that's something that's close to my heart and I think some of my listeners that went through it or they're planning maybe to move somewhere and it's always yeah. a tough one it's never an easy one as much yeah. as it looks maybe 10 years after it looks oh my god people achieve so much you're now a director or you're like a yeah, chief yeah. advisor of a company Everything looks so shiny, so bright, but the reality is once you make that move, you go through lots of difficult, challenging moments. <laughs> we actually moved to Canada the same time, same year. So I yeah. think I can totally relate in terms of the timing and how it happened. So I would love to hear your perspective and your story yeah. a little bit, like a little bit more of how you were dealing with some of the challenges. What was the most challenging part of it? And maybe what was the 
most exciting part about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, my my yeah my journey. I mean, um, I started from. Uh, um, so let's start from uh, university. Let's start. You know, I I, I joined. I was I'm in Italy at this point, and uh, and uh, we went. I, I I decided to start with biomedical engineering. Engineering. Now, um, I chose that because. Um, I, you know, my parents always said, Hey, if you're an engineer, you're going to have a good future. Uh, you know, coming from, uh, um, my parents migrated from Nigeria. I think it's common with a lot of immigrants, uh, to think about, you know, a few professions and you make sure that that's what your kids are going to do. So I was like, absolutely. Let's do that. Uh, maybe I wasn't probably, I didn't agree that much, but I did it. <laughs> and, uh, and then in the middle of that, uh, but at the same time, I, had, I attached the bio component because that was just a passion of mine. I love life sciences, um, uh, bio-related uh, type of disciplines. And so I was like, hey, biomedical engineering, I get the money plus the passion. Must be great. Um, as I'm doing that, three years into it, I realized that there was going to be a lot of math in this journey <laughs> in engineering. And it was something that I definitely underrated. Uh, and I will say that math was really not my forte. In fact, I realized that three years into it, I realized that most of it was actually math, but just called in a different way. Uh, and then they just attached a couple of anatomy courses and two biologies, and there you go. That was biomedical engineering. Uh, at least that was my experience in Italy. So at this point, I was at the University of Bologna. And so three years into this, I'm, I'm, I told myself, I, I, this is not what I want to do. This is not what I want to do. So um, I decided to to uh, pretty much leave. <laughs> leave. Uh, my parents were not too happy about that, but hey, I can't imagine. We, <laughs> we, we, you know, I was like, hey, this is this is not working for me, guys. Um, and in the midst of that, I didn't just think about changing my program, but I also thought about um, just living Italy in general. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, at the time, I could I could speak English, but it was very colloquial. I had learned English from my uh, at home, uh, but my primary first language is Italian. Um, mm -hmm. And so I also wanted an opportunity to, hey, it would be great if I move out. I'd like to learn English. So I'm in Europe right now. Uh, the UK is the place to go. Uh, so uh, so that's how I decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a step back, change program, go to the UK. Started to apply to a number of schools. England was my target until I saw the the, the fees for <laughs> for the school, uh, and so I was like, ah, maybe England might be too much. How about Scotland? Um, <laughs> and in the time Scotland, there was a number of uh, um, um, uh, uh, scholarships that I could get, um, so it ended up being much more feasible. So I was like, oh, they speak English as well there. I'm sure I could learn it. Um, and so I moved to the University of Aberdeen. I will admit that in my first couple of weeks. Uh, I, I did not know whether that was English or not. <laughs> You're right. <Yeah. laughs> Scottish English, very different from the English I was thinking about. <laughs> Definitely takes time to get used to it for sure. So getting used, and I wasn't a native English speaker either, so my English wasn't that strong. Plus, the 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 the, the difference with the accent. So I went to. Did you pick class. up the accent? Did you? <laughs> I did. I didn't pick it up, but it was enough for me to hear it. <laughs> So, so no, I think when I first came to Canada, my siblings did say, oh, you sound a little bit off. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you guys. I, Nigerian parents, grew up in Italy, went to school in Aberdeen. I don't know what my accent is from right now. So, <laughs> but I, 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 I transferred. And so I left engineering and I moved into biomedical sciences, um, majoring specifically in human physiology. So I decided to follow my interests, which was exactly around, uh, you know, those disciplines. Uh, now, uh, as most people would know, um, if you are doing biomedical sciences or any biology related type of thing, there is pretty much, you have two options. One is you're going to go through a research route, which means that you probably go to do some kind of a master's thesis based type program. And then you go into a PhD, you become a researcher or professor or maybe a Nobel Prize someday. Uh, hopefully, uh, your other route is to go towards medicine. Uh, you know, so you'll probably start applying for medic, med, med school. That's what, that's pretty much how the class usually divides itself. And so, uh, I wasn't that creative. So I did think, Hey, um, it's one of these two. I realized that being in the lab 
was probably not going to be my preferred thing. Can't really talk to, you know, uh, anyone in the lab. And I, I love talking to people. I love being in front of people. So I was like, medicine is going to be my way. So I thought about, so that was what I was working towards, you know, through, through the rest. I started again. So I started pretty much from year one and I did um, four years there. And then, um, and then when I, when I graduated, that was kind of what I was thinking about. Um, I sent a number of applications, didn't get in any school. I started reevaluating my life. In the meantime, my family left Italy and moved to Canada without telling me. No, I'm kidding. They did tell me, but <laughs> they did tell me, but they left Canada they left Italy and they're like, bye. And they moved to Canada. So I'm now in the only one in, uh, in, in Europe and I'm in Scotland. I don't really know what I'm going to do with my life. And my family also left Italy. Uh, so I'm thinking, Hey, I don't know what to do. I went on Google and I started Googling, what can I do with my bio degree? But I, I know it's, it doesn't sound as glamorous, but you know, what can I do with a bio degree? Um, and I don't know what search I did, but this program popped up, um, in Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was, it was this masters of biomedical technology. And the thing that caught me was that, um, I could combine my bio background with, just business knowledge, which at the time I really didn't know anything about business. I didn't even know what it means. But I said, hey, that sounds like something good. It seems like people are getting jobs in these areas. Why not? Let's give it a shot. I submitted an application and um, I didn't know that Calgary existed. Uh, but, but your parents, where did your parents move in Canada? My, 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 my parents moved to Red Deer, Alberta, which is an hour <laughs> and a half from Calgary. Famous Red Deer, Alberta. <laughs> That's, that, that, that is another thing that we share because my family also moved to Red Deer, Alberta, funny oh. enough. So it's <laughs> apparently <laughs> it is a place. People always ask me, why Red Deer, Alberta? I was like, I don't know. You got to talk to them. I, I, you know, I ask my parents when you see them. Why yeah. Red Deer? But that's where they settled. So, hey, Calgary, an hour and a half away, you know, close, yeah, makes sense. close, close to home. And you know, we, we, we've always been close as a family. Um, I've got three siblings um, uh, who also are here now and they live in Calgary. Um, so, yeah, so I, that made sense. I, was, I, I applied. I got in. Didn't really know what I was up to, but I came to Calgary um, and, I, and, I, and I did this program. And this program was a turnaround in my life, I will say. It was a transition point. Because it opened up, not only I was changing countries, but it opened up just a new world. I did yeah. not know anything about innovation. I didn't even think, hey, um, how does a drug get to the pharmacy, right? You know, I don't know. I just go to the pharmacy and buy them. But I had no clue of all the, malt, the you know, all of the options and, and the industry that is behind that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it was great. I think that was, I, I would say, you know, you have this, um, turning points in your life where, where things yeah. change. For me, that was one of them for sure. Yeah. And now you're leading the innovation, like we're one yeah. of the leaders in innovation in the country. So you're helping the innovation to actually happen in I Canada. <laughs> I try to be, I try to be. And that's what, you know, I, I started with biotech. Um, that was kind of my focus. Worked with a small biotech company at the end of my program. And that taught me a lot about business development and what that looks like. Um, ended up working with another organization called Innovate Calgary. Um, and that really also broadened my horizon. I understood about patents and IP and um, company formation and uh, just the path that it takes to take the technology from the lab into yeah. to market or so and all the obstacles and the hurdles. Um, yeah. And I will say it's not that glamorous. Uh, it's not that <laughs> glamorous. It's 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 very hard work journey. Yeah. Uh, and then from that was when I, I made the, the leap. I think I, I, once I found this organization, Mitex, um, for me, the main thing was um, when I was in the other side of trying to commercialize technology, uh, money was always the issue. <laughs> money was always a barrier. Um, and, and so lots of great technologies, lots of good opportunities. But um, I, I saw that we had, sometimes we had the talent, you know, there was the people, the willingness, but just the money piece was there, right? Yeah. And so joining Mitex allowed me to uh, go from, so I've been part of a startup, then I've been part of a commercialization office, and now it allowed me to jump on the other side where 
I can actually put the money in this. And so we actually provide funding for organ for for this kind of opportunities. And so it allowed me to feel, okay, finally this that I've been struggling for so long to see that I'm I'm able to play a piece on, on, on that side too. But how do you how do you distinguish which because I, I'm sure through your work you see a lot of projects companies mm -hmm. potential innovative ideas mm -hmm. do you have maybe a recipe or some sort of a template where you can kind of see or feel that the project has a bright future or great potential and what are the things that you're looking for when people are bringing projects to MyTex to your maybe team to assess. Is there anything you can share on that front? Right, right, right. Um, so, you know, one of the things on a personal level, we, 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 the truth is that I can't really predict and neither can my text. But the reality is that mm -hmm. we have a team, once a proposal is submitted, we say, uh, we have a team that works on uh, the review, on the research review. I'm more on the business development side of things. So more on the front end. Uh, but then we have a team that will look at some of the research aspects, make sure that we, and then we, our proposal usually go through an extensive peer review process. So we have the, the scientific community is actually the one to tell us, hey, is this project sound? Is it following proper principles? Is the timeline realistic? Are the objectives, um, you know, uh, are, are they realistic? Is this something that we should uh, invest in? Um, but on that, that's internally. But on a but on a first level, for me, um, I, I, this is not this is going to sound in, different. But uh, for me, a lot is about the people. Um, a lot is about the people. Um, uh, this my role has allowed me to meet I don't know hundreds of people, hundreds of people, and and uh, there's something that happens when I meet with someone that has um, they have the drive, but they also have kind of like the, the, the humility to know, hey, this is not something I know or this is not this is something I can improve on. I find myself having meetings even with entrepreneurs, multiple meetings where I meet them for, for the first time and they're not even like able to properly articulate what they're trying to work on, right? But they are but they are but they are listening, they're focused, they're determined, they're willing to change, they will they 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 hear, take advice. And then they go, we go to a second meeting and the third meeting and a fourth meeting. Um, and, and by the end of it, they, they become like, I remember this one project, I think it was about four years ago, this young uh, PhD, he had finished his PhD. Um, he was working on um, some cardiovascular related uh, technology. And, uh, and he was, you know, straight out of school, really didn't know much around this. He just knew about his technology. And I remember watching this guy and meeting with him um, several times over the period of a year and then him starting a company uh, and then going on to bringing in the right people, getting advisors and so on and forth. And right now, when I think about where where he's at, um, they've submitted something like maybe they've got probably over half a million dollars in funding from us over the year. It, was, it didn't happen in day one. It didn't happen on day one. but over multiple iterations, right? Um, he continued. He was coachable. He was determined. He went to find the right people to work with him. And so, to answer your question, I think people it tends to be my go-to, right? The uh, recipe. Uh, the recipe. Yeah, yeah. If you have the right people, of course, the technology needs to be there. There is a piece. But hey, those pieces often they can be changed. Like you can, they can pivot. So that's why the technology matters, but only to a certain degree, um, because Usually people are working on something on a problem. Usually they are not just working on something that has no, you know, no relevance. So usually there is relevance, but you can always pivot and change that. But when it, but when it comes to people, uh, that's yeah. a different game, right? You can, <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's, that's pretty much the, the circuit, the circuit sauce. Yeah. Okay. And I think that kind of leads nicely to my next maybe question or next line of questions for mm -hmm. you, because I think it takes certain pers person and I know you well enough to know that you're very good with people and you feel them and that helps mm -hmm. you probably in your, in your job, but it's also, it takes a certain character even for you to become one because over all the experiences that you've had before yourself, moving from country to country, changing your trajectory in your career, changing 
the business trajectory, changing companies, et cetera. It, it builds up the character. And I think that kind of falls into the key characteristics that people need to work on or maybe, um, I don't know, can you really work on? Yeah, I guess work on or maybe bring uh, together over your lifetime in order to achieve Mm -hmm. the goals they are actually trying to. So my, my, my next question, maybe or the line of questions would be, how do you think your experiences of changing countries, changing your careers contributed to your communication skills and meeting people and meeting those oh. people and, and having that gut feeling about people? Because I think that's very important right. business. Right. That's something right. that I learned, I learned before and I'm learning still myself that right. helps you actually, because you went through so many different changes yourself. You, right. I don't know how, but you start feeling it. So do you think right. your experiences help right. you with that? Oh yeah, that, that is a great question. And I think, I, I, absolutely. I do consider myself blessed um, to have had um, such a, a diverse background. Not by choice. I wouldn't say, it's not that I thought, oh, I'm going to travel the world and learn all these things. There are people that do that. And <laughs> I think it's a great thing to do, but I, I didn't. It was a little bit, um, it was just kind of happening step, one step at a time. But um, um, so the one quality with, that I developed, and I think people, um, it's essential for people today, would be uh, adaptability. Um, adapt, so there's adaptability without losing your identity, okay? Adaptability without using identity. Um, what does that mean? Um, so I, I grew up in Italy. And I'm at the core of who I am, I would say I'm primarily Italian. You know, you know, I, I you know, I, I eat pasta probably more frequently than most people do <laughs> here in Canada, I would say. In fact, that was one of the main cultural shocks, by the way, side note. Uh, I came to Canada and uh, I would get invited to people for lunch, right? And we're going for lunch and then people will bring out, like, what are we having for lunch? Sandwiches. And I'm like... What's going on, right? And I remember going like in a lunchroom at work, and everybody's bringing out like broccoli and carrots, and you know, like all this. <laughs> like, and I'm thinking, I grew up eating pasta every day for lunch. That is lunch, like you know, you just you have your pasta, and then you have some vegetables and some meat on the side, and a little bit of um, espresso at the end. And if you do drink wine, a little half a glass of wine helps you too. Uh, and so the thought, so that was a big cultural shock, just how people ate. I was like, why do you get eat sandwiches all the time? And they're cold. <laughs> so cold food was just not something that I did. Anyways, um, <laughs> I, I did overcome now. I, I'm still not a fan of cold food and sandwiches, but I, I have, I have lunch to, to, to turn down on my pasta intake. <laughs> Uh, so back to back to what were we talking about? Sorry, I did lose. Um, I did lose. I think I think we were. You were I was asking about adaptability. Adapt. I was talking about adaptability and one of those things that I developed. An so, identity, how to keep it because it's very important. I think I really want you to talk about it because I think that's something really to yes. bring up. Yes, yes, adaptability and identity. So I, I felt that I grew up at the core of Italian. Uh, my parents are Nigerian and. And in our home, we grew up with a lot of values mm -hmm. and morals that come from my, um, I guess, Nigerian side, right? So African side. Um, now, so living, I left, you know, as an Italo Nigerian and I went to Aberdeen, new culture, the way people relate, the way you form relationships, the way you stand out in the workplace. As you can tell, I'm black. Uh, I tend to be a minority everywhere that I am, at least in this part of the world. Uh, so I did grow up as a minority. Uh, and so there's always this idea, okay, for example, one, one immediate one is my accent. Uh, so there's this idea that, oh, I have to change my accent so that people can understand what I'm saying. Uh, because if, I don't, if they don't understand what I'm saying, I may not get the job or I may not, you know, that people might struggle, right? Um, and, uh, uh, or just in, you know, just that, that's one, I think that's one immediate example, but also how I create friendships, right? You know, Italy, Italians, we're very forward. We are very, um, we either like you or we don't. And when we do like you, you know, and when we don't, you also know, right? Uh, um, uh, coming to Canada, a, a little different, right? You know, like, you know, I always wondered, sometimes I was like, do you like me? Do you not like me? I mean, you're really nice to me. And, and being polite is, I think it's part of the Canadian culture, but 
what what may not be polite to us in Italy was, was I, I thought that was polite, and then here maybe being that direct, it's not. So adapting with keeping your identity, I think it starts from knowing that who you are at the core, um, it's not wrong, right? Who you are at the core, it's not wrong. Even when I go in a system or in a place where others may not be the way they are, and the battle becomes, oh, uh, for me to be accepted or for me to be, uh, you know, for me to advance, I need to be like my environment, right? Or, or I have to be like the people around me. Uh, but I think beginning to accept yourself for who you are and beginning to accept that those unique qualities, those things that are, are given to you, and there is nothing wrong with them. Uh-huh. And, and treasuring those things, treasuring those aspects as well of your personal identity even if, if even if even if you are the only one currently in the in the room that that is like that i think there is there is so much power i actually think that that's what true diversity is um and and, uh, and at the same time now being able to use your unique traits your identity um in a way that you can capture your audience or that you can portray that not as uh, less or as, uh, oh, because you don't speak a lot. But sometimes I use it, you know, in jokes. For example, I spoke about pasta, how I eat pasta. And for me, that's that's a simple go-to humor way. Easy. It's a way to connect. Easy yeah. way to connect, right? And so I use that all the time. I connect on some of my differences, right? And I don't, sh- I'm not shaming people who don't eat pasta. <laughs> every day i don't understand them but <laughs> but i do uh, uh, but at the same time i actually use it to connect with people i, I use it to connect with people um in one way or the other right you know uh, whether it's being able to pronounce my name sometimes um you know I, i've had people spell my last name my last name is Nguyen. a lot of people say all kind of things around Nguyen. it'll be like somebody called me nigel one time and I, and I was like, oh, like, I've never heard that one. But hey, I don't take it offensively. I usually, you know, I usually smile over it. Um, but I've been able to learn others, learn their culture, right? So learn, okay, this is what I do. Not shame it, not like put it down, um, you know, embrace the things that I enjoy, right? The things that I enjoy and keep the ones that are dear to me, right? So now you will find me do this. I'll tell you, I, I will. Um, you know, have espresso in the afternoon because that's a classic Italian thing to do. But I'll drink El Grey tea with milk every night, every night before bed. And that's something that I picked up while I was in uh, in the UK. Uh, and so that that's a very strange mix, right? Are you Italian? Yeah. I, I like it. Uh, it gives me peace. And so I've picked that up and, uh, and, it, and it works, right? You know, when it comes to business context, of course, I think learning proper business etiquette in, in certain environments uh, is always good. But I never lose that piece of my identity. Everybody knows that, uh, that I will voice my opinion. At some point in the conversation, I will voice my opinion. I will say what I think, even if it might be a little bit uncomfortable, right? Um, so for me, not losing that part of who I am uh, becomes, uh, you know, it, it, it's very dear to me. And I think, and I think if we all did that, Mm-hmm. Um, we would enrich our environments way more than, um, you know, adapting and just becoming l- like the norm. So the same, when I yeah. say adaptability, what I mean is not just becoming, you know, changing all the time. Uh huh. I just mean being able to be who you are in a new environment, in a new system and continue to add value, continue to add value, continue to bring, um, when I was hired at Innovate Calgary, um, there was another applicant um, that had better qualifications than I did, that was more suitable for the job. I thought I wasn't going to get it. And then I got hired. I asked my manager later on, why did you hire me? And he said to me, you know, you were probably not the person on the resume, but when we met you, we hired you because you were different. And we wanted something different. All mm-hmm. right? We didn't want to say. And if I had if I had tried to not be different and be just like everybody else, I would have probably missed out on that opportunity. Yeah. But what do you say? Like, let's say some people, you had it naturally, like you said, not by choice, but just naturally progress to the point you were at, where you at right now. But some people would say, well, but how do you develop it? If let's say you have not left the country, if you stay in the same place, how do you first 
keep that identity that you have and maybe nourish it and develop it and like you said, cherish it inside of you, but also how do you learn to communicate and meet people, and especially people from different cultures, different places? Do you think you can learn that? Do you think you can develop it in yourself? Do you have anything on that? Because I think yeah. people might ask that question. It's like, well, you have that experience of changing yeah. places, but what if I don't? Can, how can I improve yeah. it? Yeah, no, I think I think that that is a, a a very good question, and and I think you can I think you can learn this. So I think the first thing is. Um, I need to have a certain level of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness, just knowing what I do know and what I don't know uh, and being very intentional about it, right? I think many times it's not that someone has not traveled enough or has not met people that is the problem. I think sometimes it's just this um, this ignorance that that I think comes also for just poor self-awareness is is this idea that, I don't. I don't even fathom that someone else might be different, or I just go by the assumption that mine is the default. You know, my way is the way, I, and never even ponder on the idea. So, if I don't ponder on the idea, I will not develop the curiosity. So, I think that anyone that does pause and oh, they, they, they could be different. Automat. That's step one. Step two will be you will have a natural curiosity. And when life presents you the opportunities, and I think we're in the world that we live now, life will present you the opportunities. We live in a very interconnected world, right? Whether you're going to, you know, whether you watch a movie on Netflix and right now you see Netflix has all kinds of shows from all kinds of nationalities, right? Or cultures, right? So whether you're watching a documentary or whether you are following whatever pages on your Instagram or social media, uh, or what, and, and of course your environment, the world is like in Canada, and luckily we, we, you know, we, we have, I think lots of immigrants and people from other cultures. So, uh, if, if once you have that curiosity, I think you will begin to pursue those things or those relationships. And if it's not relationships, is these other things that I spoke about. It could be a show. It could be a book. It could be just something that you're following on Instagram. It could be just the news and, and that inquisitive mind will lead you to actually learning new things and just being open to that, to, to develop that adapt, adaptability. But it does take, you've, it is a little uncomfortable, okay? <laughs> it is more comfortable to be, uh, to be like everyone else, right? It is more comfortable to just keep the norm. Uh, so, so you will have to overcome that discomfort that comes from not knowing or from Maybe asking questions that are, uh, that are, that are little, um, you know, out of the norm or, or, or from looking like, you know, uh, like you, like you don't know something. And so you don't want to look stupid or so, so, and so, so once you overcome that discomfort, uh, then I think, then I think anyone can learn it. Anyone can learn it. You've got to be intentional about it. Um, and, and you've got to always ask yourself, you know, just be aware of who is around you, what is happening in around your world we have all the tools today to do that so yeah. i think no one is excused i agree but i have two things here the first one how did you overcome those things because when you are going from place to place and you are being in a different environment and yeah. when you are asking maybe silly questions sometimes uncomfortable questions like i've went through myself right because you have to yeah. when you're in a different environment yeah yeah it's it, it yeah. happens so how long did it take you to overcome that to find your identity or maybe you didn't lose it but you just felt that for a little bit you were just challenged so what was that transition like and how did you overcome it what helped you yeah yeah uh so uh, coming um and so i think one of my uh so i'll put it this way when i when i came um to canada um the, so my i started really easy for, for getting comfortable. And by easy, I mean, I gravitated towards other immigrants. <laughs> I aggregated towards other people who had the same struggles and who I could relate. And I think that's something that we would all do. Like we're just kind of looking for uh, this, uh, you know, one of my close friends, his name is uh, uh, Pedro. He's from uh, Guatemala and he was also new to Canada. And I remember the first day in class that we were just both new. And I said, hey, I'm new. I don't know anybody. I'm looking for friends. He said, I'm new. I don't know anybody. I'm looking for friends. I said, let's be friends. That's kind of like, it was fairly easy to connect on that level. Um, but but I didn't want to do the thing where I just stay, you know, within my comfort and just where I also wanted to learn the culture in here. So what is it that helped me in particular? I think 
I, I, I think so. Part of it was that I was kind of I didn't really have the choice not to. <laughs> so it wasn't really a, I, you know I you know like for example I needed to work right and I needed to get jobs and to get jobs I needed to do to get what they call Canadian experience at the time right um, and and to get Canadian experience I, I cannot just be hanging out with my immigrants friends we we all looking for that so I needed so networking was a huge piece so I started networking my program did school program as you know encouraged it a lot but even after the program. I, I actually made networking just a lifestyle. Um, and it wasn't networking with, you know, when you call it networking, it sounds really business, business. It was just, I became good at building relationships. And that's what I've been doing. It's part of my job description right now, but, but it's just what I, I do in general, right? Um, just building relationships. You can call it networking, whatever, but I would go out and, uh, and in an event, I would just try and talk to, you know, it didn't have to be everybody, but two or three people. And when I spoke with people, what I would do is this. I would go, it's, you know, when I ask questions or when I, when I try to connect with someone, I try to connect on a deeper level by asking questions that, um, that go into deeper aspects of who they are, what they think, how they feel. Um, so rather than just asking, what do you do? So you the ask, weather. what do you do? Or, or about the weather, you know, all these lateral questions where you're like, you know, you never really get to know what someone is thinking, what their mood is. And I always try to go one level deeper, right? And if they give me that chance to, for that level, I'll go another level deeper, right? Um, it may not all happen in that one event. Maybe in one event, I can, I'm able only to go, you know, wh what do you do for work? Or what do you like so much about your work? And, oh, are you the kind of person that that does this, right? And that's how, how far I can go. Maybe next time I meet them, I'll find out about their families, right? And, and I'll find out about how they like to spend their holidays. And then they'll invite me. Usually I'll get invited to some kind of, you know, they tell me, somebody told me, you know, the first time I went skiing, I didn't know about skiing. Obviously, I'm, I, I didn't ski. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I've never tried, but hey, I'll try it out, you know? And it was someone, you know, Canadian that invited me and, and showed me I tried snowboarding. Didn't work, but I did try it. I did it two, three times. <laughs> then I did skiing a little bit better. You know, somebody said, "Hey, let's try." They were talking about hockey all the time. They took me to a hockey game. I tr I tried skating. I can skate now. You know, not not to the hockey level, but I can skate. I can move around. So, building relationships was huge, right, for me. Uh, but just one person at a time, right? Just one person at a time. <laughs> And just asking good questions, going deeper uh, in my questions rather than asking about and just getting to know people um, was, was yeah. my way. But why do you think people are maybe scared sometimes to go and ask those deeper questions? Because it seems to be for you, maybe it came naturally, but you know how some people, they're afraid of asking deeper questions. And there's that etiquette where you just talk about some superficial topics when you meet. So why do you think that is? Yeah, my thought is this the fear usually i think that people are usually thinking about themselves mm -hmm. uh mostly so and we all we will all do it what i mean is i think our fear comes from our deep sense of insecurity and inadequacy and so i walk into the room and when you walk into a room and you say oh i wonder what people are thinking about you know my skin color or i wonder what thinking about about my accent or maybe I feel that I'm too fat, or maybe I feel that I'm too short, or maybe I feel I'm not dressed appropriately, and I'm constantly thinking about myself. And because I'm thinking so much about myself and my and what and what people might be thinking about me, it might stop me from actually asking questions. I mean, I, I mean, on you know, uh, because I'm already I just have this barrier, right? And um, and so what I what I suggest is uh, it's just trying to look in the room. Uh, and rather than, it is very likely that you're thinking about yourself, but also somebody else is actually thinking about themselves and they're not really thinking about you. <laughs> they're not really thinking. The time that we actually spend thinking about others is minimal. We are probably mostly thinking about you. So if you walk in the room now and you start thinking about them, about the others, right? You know, like, yeah. and, and that, I think that's a huge liberator breaker for a sense. For a moment, you're like, okay, it's not about me. It doesn't matter. I'm not even thinking about me. But I'm just, I just see you over there and you tell me something and now you tell me that, hey, you came from this place. Oh, I wonder what caused you to come from Toronto to Calgary. I just, just pure curiosity, right? 
uh, oh, I wonder what, why did you decide to do law when you started a degree in X, right? You know, uh, and you actually begin to be interested, thinking about them and what could be their story, their struggles, yep. their challenges, and their way of thinking. And you, you feel liberated. Uh, you feel liberated because you don't even have to worry about you yourself. Now. And so now you walk in a the room, there is 100 people, and there are 100 people that you, that you could think about, right? You know? So thinking about yourself a little less and thinking about others, I think it's a great way to, to overcome um, this this mm-hmm. barrier of not just wanting to ask. And I think that also touches on the self-awareness piece, because that was the second question I had from, from mm-hmm. your previous story. Because I think when right. you, people say you need to be more self-aware, but not many people really know what that means, or maybe they know, but they don't know how to even assess yeah. themselves, right? Like yeah. live inten- with intention, be self-aware, be self-aware, but what does it mean to be self-aware? So how, so I think that's part of it, like to be self-aware that maybe you should think less of, I don't know, of what, what people think about you and maybe nobody really cares, right? So maybe you need to open up, but that's part of it. Care a little bit about others. I, you know, I, um, I, 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 there is a group that I, that I lead uh, through my church and, uh, and, and, and this very week we actually have, I I love, I I sent a challenge to everyone and I said, uh, let's try something this week. Try and not think about yourself. (laughs) <laughs> that much, too much. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and, and try and try this. Just try and think about somebody else. Somebody else that will not, you know, they're not going to offer you a job. They're not going to do anything for you. So it's just about them. And just pr- try and practice this idea of just caring about someone else. I'm not thinking of. I'm not even saying. You know, sometimes we see all these big causes. Um, you know, there is wars going on, and all of a sudden we're all caring about the people that are suffering. We're all caring about it, you know, we're sending money and we're doing all these charitable acts, which, you know, it's great. But I think in a, on a very simple, much simpler level, that doesn't even require money. It's actually free. Just try and think about a colleague at work that you see every day. Just think about them. Think about their situation. Think about what they're going through, what they might be going through, and then ask them questions. Hey, how's your week? How's your baby doing? Hey, I, or last, you know, how was the, and usually two, three, four questions, tops, something will come up that is, that you probably didn't know. Like if you just continue, if you genuinely begin to care about others, right? And then you do it one time, you do it two times, you do it three times. And before you know it, you're spending your week and you're like, you think about that person. Oh, I wonder how Anna is doing. I haven't heard from Anna anywhere. Boom. You send a message. Hey, how are you doing? I was thinking about you. Um, it's very rare. I don't know if it happens to you. You tell me. But how many text messages do you receive from people that are not in your regular, you know, your regular friends, uh, but just other people that say, hey, I was thinking about you. How are you doing? Like, does, is that frequent? No, but I do have, unfortunately, it's not. <laughs> but I do have some examples of uh, of some people that are not yeah. in my immediate, yeah, in my in, not in my immediate circle. And when they heard, let's say I had some difficult situation in my family, they would reach out out of nowhere. And that was actually quite, uh, yeah, that was very humbling and very, yeah. very interesting experience in the sense of that. It may, makes makes you feel that, you know what, there are some people, they do care. And they're, I, not I, your, they're not your friends, but they just reach out because they heard something and they just, they make an effort. And I think that definitely what you said definitely makes sense. I love that. I love when people do it. It like when I receive one of those is rare, but when I receive that, it always it always like, oh wow, you actually thought about me. Like it makes me think, you know. And it's not they didn't send me money, they didn't do anything. My situation mm-hmm. didn't change, but it's such a little thing that we can do, um, yeah. and I think it's gonna help. It, it it helps us to rid ourselves of, of a lot of the you know fears that we have and insecurities, and, and just become more. Um, um, mind that you know, just to care about others, care about people. I agree, and I also think it makes you feel connected to other people, and also makes you feel more grateful, and yes. you want to do the same to other people because when you are going through a great time and you are full of energy and things are going well for you, it doesn't really matter that much. But when you go through some low times, right. and that happens, I think that's the moment. At least for me, that was the moment where you start to cherish your the people in your life again. It doesn't have to be immediate circle. People exactly. in your life, you cherish them even more. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I feel like that self-awareness thing is it's such a trendy word, but I don't yeah. know if anyone really talks how to achieve that self-awareness. And where is that moment where you feel, feel like finally you are maybe cl or close to it? Obviously, you will never be 100%, but you're close to it. And mm -hmm. you... Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's another one. I think people don't really talk about how they come to it. Do you do you remember that moment where you felt that you're happy with who you are, how you are, and your intentions and living intentionally, like you said? Like, do you remember right. when that happened and how right. you achieved that? Uh, I think I, I think I, I, I wouldn't say I remember when that happened, but I do think that there were um, definitely um, seasons or periods in my life. Uh, where it, it happened and it keeps happening, right? It keeps, mm -hmm. it, 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 so I don't think, you know, there was one time that it happened and from that day, uh, that's what I did. But it, it, it happened more, I think it happened multiple times um, where I felt, okay, I think I, I think I know where I am. I think I know where I'm going. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now, and then, and now I'm, I'm, I think I've obtained this piece of uh, awareness. Um, but for me, I think self-awareness might happen um, in, um, in different, um, areas. So it keeps, so it's an, it's a thing that keeps with happening. And so in one period of my, uh, of my life, so I'll tell you my most recent one, mm -hmm. uh, I think in the last, uh, so I got married in 2020. Uh, and, uh, so now we're in 2023. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things that I have, thought about in the last two years so it's a so it's, it's, it's it took me a, a little bit but i've been chewing on this for a while and uh, i think i've been I've become aware of um where i am um is is good where i am is good what i have is good um what i've been able to do is good what i have achieved or is good and the keyword is good, and and it's okay. Um, if I'll, I'll advance, if if I was to not um, achieve more, for example, you know, you know, I, I you know, I, one of the things I always said growing up and um, um, was, oh, one day I'm going to be a CEO, right? You know, I, um, but and, and in the last two years, I've been like, um, why does that does that matter to me? And what what if I did not become one, right? Uh -huh. uh, what if I did not you know, start a multi-million dollar business and then I did not, you know, run 15 marathons and I did not build 16 side hustles and, and, and build a large social media following of million followers. Then what if I didn't do all those things? And I would say it would still be good. Where I am, who I am is good. Um, and, and I've come to terms with that because one of the fears that I think I had before was more about, Oh, I just don't want to, I want to make sure I do everything that I'm meant to do. And I'm looking at everybody doing what they're doing. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, time is running out. And, and I still haven't done this. And I still haven't reached this. And I still haven't done this. And, and as though that is, you know, what, you know, I, I'm still not successful, right? You know, for whatever success that, that, that means. So coming to this realization that what I have is good, right? You know, um, you know, the, the, ev that everything I have is good has brought me to my, my key word, I would say, um, for the last little bit has been, uh, simplicity. Uh -huh. Just living in simplicity. Um, just being content, contentment, um, in, in where I'm at, in, in, in who I'm with. I have found so much, such a huge treasure, um, in my relationship with my wife and in, in building that relationship and just, um, kind of learning who she is and how she is and, and looking at, uh, and, you know, in many ways we're very different, right? You know, she's, um, she's more, I'm more like goal driven, you know, let's do this, let's go there. Huh? And she's more like, you know, some, let's pause and look at the birds and look at the sky. Let's go for a walk, that kind of thing. Right? I've never went for a walk before. I was like, why would I go for a walk? <laughs> you know, you want to drive somewhere, <laughs> but not walk. <laughs> That's way too slow for me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I've learned so much from her. Uh, and and so this has been a new realization. So back to your self awareness piece. I think at different points in life, we're going to become aware of a certain state. We're going to say, "Yes, this is who I am." We're going to, and when we can stand in that identity, then we are now able to go back outside and then look at you know the world a little bit differently and look at others and just be okay and ask those questions and care about others and 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 so forth.
Yeah, but it almost like it enriches you even more. So I it agree. almost feels like it enriches you even more to coming from that place versus the place of never ending chase, right? But what I is agree. what 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 is what is your definition of success then? How do you define success? <laughs> Such a, that's a that it's that's a hard question. Um, how do I define the sex? Maybe today, this is how I define it today. Maybe tomorrow, if you ask me, I'll have a different definition. Uh, but I think for me, success right now, it's um, doing, um, doing what you said you were going to do. Um, and, uh, and, on, and uh, so doing what you said you were going to do, being through to who you are, uh, and just living out in your present moment, um, everything that you were meant to do in that present moment. So mm -hmm. often we think about su success is usually thrown out in the future and is usually tied to s numbers or some kind of results, right? So we, we look at success and, you know, if you take it in social media, it's a certain number of followers. If you take it in money, it's a certain type of income. It's a big thing. So there is a number attached to success. But I think um, while for me, uh, I'm looking at success more from um, on a daily basis, on a daily basis, um, if I leave out, and I, so there isn't a number to it, uh, but if I leave out um, my identity in all, in all the different areas of my life, right, um, and I do the things that I believe are good, are right, right, and I do those things and I continue to do them day in and day out, then I'm successful. I can ask myself at the end of the day, Today was I successful, and so I can look at, you know, I can look at my day, and I was like, okay, what investment did I make in my relationship with my wife? What investment did I make in my personal development? What investment did I make in my, um, in my health and fitness? What investment did I make in managing uh, my my finances or or what I'm doing today? Just today alone, just today alone, right? You know. Yeah. Um, and I was like, did I make those? Did I did I leave out those things? Did I make those invest those little deposits? Yeah, that's success. Boom. And like that, I get to be successful every day rather than have to wait to until reach, <laughs> until I reach you know whatever I need to reach, and then I can be successful. Yeah, I can relate to that. I think it's great, and I want to let you know that you're one of those people in my life, and. That's why I'm so happy to have you on my podcast because I wanted to share your story with people because you're one of the people that had an impact on me at some point of time when we met and we worked together and then we had um, meetings as friends after we stopped working mm -hmm. together. And I remember that I was inspired by the way you organize your life and your thoughts and your goals, the way you put those in with intention and how you change things around. And I remember how you were sharing with me, how you go through a process of change yourself, because that was crucial for me in those moments mm -hmm. too. And I have my way to structure my own goals and how you, how I process them, but mm -hmm. you had an impact on me. And I think that's very inspiring. And I, maybe, maybe actually I'll ask you to, to tell again, maybe a little bit more about how you go through that goal setting process. Because to me, what you just described, it is a great definition of success. Mm -hmm. I think if everyone would maybe divide life by day by day and just be happy each day, mm -hmm. the overall cumulatively, the, their life would be happier, right? So right. can you tell more how you go through that goal setting portion and how you actually mm, set yourself for that bigger success, but also smaller success that you go right. day by day. Right, right, right. Um, yes. Um, uh, so I, I'm glad actually that, it, you know, that whatever I shared with you, I don't remember what I did share with you, but I, but I do remember, but I, I'm glad that it, it, it helped. Um, I, I have been changing my goal process over the years, over the time. So um, I think early on, I've always been one to set goals for the year. Um, we just started a new year, so I know a lot of people are doing goal setting exercises. Um, so I've always been that type. Um, in the beginning, I know I used to set a lot of um, number type based goals, measurables, you know, smart goals, those kind of things. And I will say that you know they, they helped me achieve some s certain things. I, I don't think they were terrible. Um, they they helped me in some ways, right? So it was great. It was great financial goals, you know, just. Um, whatever you say, work out two times a week, three times a week, whatever that is. Um, now, where I'm at now, um, I started 
um, more than writing goals, um, I started writing what I call uh, formations. So formations are um, essentially statements um, around your identity. Uh, you, you see, I'm kind of fixated with this topic of identity, <laughs> but I, I think it's I think it's every you know I think it's fundamental. So um, I started writing these statements and I broke them down in categories. Um, so um, for me, you know, there's there anyone could have their own categories that matter, but you know, I've got my spiritual life, and then I've got my family, um, and then I've got health and fitness. I've got um, career uh, and business, and then I've got personal development in there. So for me, there are five categories that I look into, and in each of those categories, I write um, I write a statement of who I am in those areas, who I am. So, and I'm, I'm specific about saying not just who I want to be, because um, who I want to be sends it into the future again, um, but it's who I am. Um, and so, um, and so by, by spelling out those, um, let's call it, um, you know, you know, those, those statements about my identity and about the kind of person that I am out of those, um, certain natural, uh, uh, things will flow out of them. For example, if in my, in my health and fitness, um, I, I say, you know, I am uh, a person who, uh, moves daily. Uh, on, an, on a regular basis, who moves daily on a regular basis. Uh, and it sounds like a very simple thing, but because I am that kind of person, some days, uh, most days, I'll, I'll go to the gym in the morning before work. But um, but if I'm unable to do that, um, you know, I'm part of a volleyball team. And so um, I, I do, I like martial arts, jujitsu, those kind of things. And sometimes none of those things happen, but it could be, uh, it could be just having a walk, standing up. In other words, it is now part of my identity, which means that for the rest of my life, I'm going to leave this thing out. So it's not, so for me, it's no longer, you know, um, being a certain size or a certain weight or lifting a certain amount of weight. It's just, it's become part of my identity. So come rain, come shine. This is just what, this is just who I am. And because of who I am, I do these things, right? So I do the, so I don't do things to just become someone. It's because of who I am that I do these things. Um, in my in money spending category, you know, you could have goals of how much money you want to make or save or sales numbers and things like that. And those are all very useful. But above that, I do have just a way of living, right? You know, for me, a big aspect of living is contentment. Um, um, and so, you know, living simply, um, uh, being a good, a, a being, you know, responsible of who you are, but also being someone who gives freely. Um, so that's why I'm someone who I am. And so writing those things out allows me to um, to live successfully every day because I can review my year um, and I can say, hey, you know, you may have not made whatever, you know, the, the number of, money, you know, whatever numbers you may have had, but did I live out this thing? Is this who I am? When, when someone talks about me, right uh, is this what they say right and mm -hmm. then at the bottom of this at the bottom, so i have those five categories i write all these statements in these statements now um at the bottom of this i write five virtues that mm -hmm. i want to be known by and it's just you know just keywords right you know like you know one of them is humility for example but five virtues that i want to be known by in other words what is dear to me so when somebody says speaks about me I hope that one of those five things they're gonna they're gonna say without me having said it to you, right? Yeah. But yeah, and that's really you know, so it forces me to live my life in a certain way. It puts it puts the boundaries and and the, and kind of it, it lights the path that I, that I need to 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 live out, and it, it it automatically drives me to achieve those goals. And then lastly, the I think the most the secret ingredient is this: it's it's that my number one goal is to actually review, reassess, reconsider, think, reflect on this one piece of paper every month at the start of the month. Okay. So that's my number one goal is to review it every, my actual goal, you know, that's the one numeric goal. At the start of the month, I want to take 
you know, a couple of hours to sit on this and review it, examine. So I can say, hey, am I living out this distance? What did it look like, right? Yeah. Um, where is it that I am? And I want to remind myself of who I am, how I'm living, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's, that's, that's my goal, goal setting process. No, that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> I remember it from so many years back, the way how you were processing it. And I remember that was very inspiring and impactful at that time. So yeah. and now it's as profound now. And it seems like you went through a yeah. refining process and it's, yeah. it's lovely. Again, simple, sounds simple, yeah. but so deep and not that easy. Yeah. <laughs> not that easy. What do you think you know, about it? Uh, mm -hmm. bef before I actually used, I had, a, you know, this, I had all kind of, I read a lot into this goal setting team. Uh, you know, I was running a side business and I was trying to figure out, you know, business goals and all things. And again, it's not to say that those things are bad. I think, I think this could be either your way, goal setting, or it could be an added thing to add. But um, I, it, it, I had like three, four, five, six pages broken down of things that I wanted to do and how I do it. But this is now one page. The reason why yeah. it's one page is because I need to be able to just look. I need to be able to recall it yeah. pretty easily. And I need to be able to just look at it all in one page, all in one page. So, uh, so stripping out actually and making it simpler, like almost using just regular language, yeah. um, uh, was difficult. So it, it did take a little bit, but once once it's done, it feels it feels um, very freeing. It feels very freeing. Yeah. No, I think again, I think it's it's it sounds simple, but it's not that easy to do. But once you do it, I can imagine how freeing it can be and because there's so many so many books and so many people talking about goal setting but nobody really talks how they do it they just like oh just get up at 5 a.m in the morning and I don't know, do the 10 things that all the millionaires are doing but i don't think that's really how it works it's a, it's a deep work with yourself and going through all the all the spots inside of you that you can actually put on paper. So it's, I think it's very powerful. I agree. And, and, and do you have any, any new projects maybe that you're working on? Cause knowing you, you always have something like you said, side business, side ideas, you're a guest speaker somewhere, you're performing somewhere. So do you have anything for this year that you're planning to? For this, uh, for this year. Um, uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so right now uh, I, uh, so my, my, I'm reading this book. Um, and it's uh, and the book is called uh, um, I have it right here. It's called okay. How How to Get Paid for What You Know. How to Get Paid okay. for What You Know. Okay, and for those is, who cannot see the book, I will share the title and the author in the description of my podcast. But you can also say who who wrote the the it author. It is for, the from uh, Graham Cochran. Graham mm -hmm. Cochran. Um, I haven't finished it. It's half a friend of mine recommended it. And I'm already recommending it. I'm halfway through it. Um, but, uh, uh, and essentially it's talking about the knowledge economy, uh, and really how to, uh, begin to create a potentially an online business, um, uh, around the things that you know, right? So, but it's very, very practical. It, it walks you through how to identify, you know, what it is that you know and how to share it and all the steps that go in there. And so I'm doing those exercise, that exercise in there. And uh, what's what's on my mind? What has been on my mind for a long time? Um, so I've always been interested in uh, mentorship, mentorship, mentoring, um, specifically mentoring um, uh, uh, people like like you and I. <laughs> so uh, uh, what I mean is, so I find that I don't know. You tell me, but I find that you know there is this decade or couple of decades. So between t your twenties, you know, twenty. To 40. So those are two decades of your life that are crucial, right? So it's not the biggest, uh, but I, and they're crucial because I find that you basically make so many important life changing decisions, right? So people find a partner for life. You, 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 you start a career, you finish school, restart school, decide which, what are you going to be, you know, when you grow up. It, it happens in that period of time. And I feel the first decade, the 20 to 30, is even harder because. You're making some of the biggest decisions of your life and you are probably the least equipped to do the, to make those decisions. Like we usually become wiser later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so we're just thrown out there. We're making like massive decisions and we just don't have the tools. We don't know what we're doing. Most of the time we're just stumbling through it, right? Trying to find yeah. a way. And so 
I feel that that segment, um, uh, yeah, but in, in that journey, there's so much pain and there's so much hurt. And this is why I find that a lot of people uh, get lost in this, in, this, in this piece of life. They get lost um, or they're too hurt, too broken. Um, I think that in many ways, um, we don't have enough either as role models or um, I don't know if you've ever... You know, I, 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 most people that have gone through something will tell you that um, having someone, a uh, mentor, coach, someone who believed in it, someone who guided them, yeah. was was made the you know yeah. made the difference. Like made a difference. Most people will agree with that. And so for me, um, that particular pe- group um, uh, of people, it's dear to my heart. I know what my struggles have been. Uh, I know what they are currently. But I also feel that I, I have something to share um, in in those areas. Uh, for uh, and so, just about life, uh, it could be relationships, it could be uh, money and finance, or, or just personal leadership. I think those are three big things that uh, people in those decades wrestle and deal with a lot. Mm. Um, and so, I'm thinking, um, how do I do this uh, in a, on a larger scale? Um, so. You know, when it comes, you know, ment- when it comes to mentoring, you usually do one-on-one men- uh, uh, mentoring or coaching, and uh, but that can only go so far. Uh, you can only have you only have so many hours in a day, and so I'm thinking, how how can I scale that? How can I grow that? Um, um, what is it that trying to understand? What is it that people need? But I do think that I have a few things that people might might need, and so I'm thinking, I'm uh, I'm planning this year to put together something. Uh, you know, whether it's resources, materials, maybe even form some kind of organizations around this, mm-hmm. uh, but to really help um, help navigate that journey um, that, you know, that goes from, you know, that, you know, those two decades of your life. Um, and, and how do you make it through uh, this valley on the, on the other side? <laughs> so yeah. still, it's, still, it's still in process. I'm still thinking yeah. about it, working on that, yeah. but that's, that's, what, that's what I'd like to do. But I think it'll be great in that because you already just just simply what you've already shared. It's also a big part. It's already a, a huge component. If someone can use it, you don't have to copy things, but if mm-hmm. you use it as a roadmap to create your own way of setting up goals and looking at things from the positive angle, mm-hmm. helping others, thinking less about yourself, thinking more about other people, just following those steps and being guided in that direction. You're already doing that. You're already helping so many people just kind of sharing that information because I think we don't talk about it enough, I think, on right. day-to-day basis because we are more about goals, like you said, numbers, right. numbers, yeah. like yeah, where yeah, do yeah. you work? What was your title? What is, where are you going next? So right. we, I think we're shifting the focus very often. So it's nice right. to go back to that and kind of move along the trajectory that you are um setting up for yourself so i think right. i think you'll be very good at it thank you i think thank yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thanks for sharing the book because i think it's also important because part of the well the goal of my podcast is obviously mm-hmm. education information and right. giving people some value i think sharing your story sharing the books that you're reading that people my guests are reading i think that's always a great uh, addition to what i'm trying to do Lovely. for my listeners yeah Okay, I think we are kind of running out of time as much as I love talking to you. And I think we can talk for hours. I know we can. We've done that before. (laughs) I have so many topics and so many questions for you. We can talk about so many different things for hours. I guess we have to, I mean, wrap up a little bit here. So I tried to, um, I tried to end up my podcast with a question about travel because that's the, that's, one of the things that I'm passionate about, and I also believe that traveling and changing places for different reasons, for work, for pleasure, just just to travel and change environments helps mm-hmm. people to open up the horizons and develop themselves quicker and be exposed to different things and adapt, etc. So I usually ask my guests to share where they would go next if they would choose a destination for their travel and why they would go there. Right, right. Okay, good. Um, so right now, uh, I'm thinking we have on our, uh, on our list of places to go. We want to go to Ghana and Nigeria. So Ghana and Nigeria. So the reason why is my wife is from Ghana. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, I'm or- originally from Nigeria. Um, uh, we both, um, so I, I was born in Italy, grew up in Italy. Uh, my wife was born in uh, Ghana, but she left when she was quite little. Uh, and she primarily grew up here. Um, she had 
um, lots of relatives and grandparents are there. Uh, and so we would love to go visit. Um, I've never been to Ghana since we and since we, we got married during COVID, didn't really, yeah. uh, I, I you know, didn't really travel all that much. We just started traveling last year again. Um, and so, yeah, so we want to do this trip. And if we're going to Ghana, Nigeria is really close by. Uh, so I was like, yeah. hey, if we're going, if we're going to go to Ghana. It makes sense to also go to Nigeria. I want to show you uh, a little bit of um, where my family is from. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a lot of family left there, but uh, I have a few aunties and people there um, that I'd love to visit. And so it would be great to we, we're able to do it since yeah. we're already in Africa. We might, we might as well hit those two places. Awesome. I would love to have you back to my podcast at some point in the future. Maybe the next one, you, when you've done that trip, I can ask you more questions about your, no. your adventures. Because I also know that in the past, you work on some volunteering opportunities in yeah. And you, I remember that. So yes, yes. I, I would love to ask you more about that maybe next time. And yeah. it would be great to have you again and talk about more topics because I have <laughs> so many, so many things that we can talk about. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a pleasure for me. It's a pleasure chatting with you every time. You know, I know we, we spent um, many, we've had many long <laughs> chats. Conversations. Uh, conversations. Yeah. And, and the always, soul searching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, no, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for having me on your, thank your, you. on your, on your podcast. That was fantastic. And thank you for sharing all of the stories that you shared. Those are great. Yeah. And yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you soon and I'll hopefully connect with you outside of this podcast very soon too. Sounds good. 